Hello, hello. How are you guys? Good coffee break? Okay. Who enjoyed the coffee? Yeah. Come in, come in. Uh, so, uh, here we are. My name is Johan and we are um, about 10 or 11 years post uh, Genesis and uh, still when I am or when I live in the crypto space, um, not having a bank account, paying all my invoices with Ether and all like that, I feel like this guy. Um, who thinks um, it who feels like this guy and also has a feeling that kind of cryptocurrency is nice but the average Joe knows nothing about it. Cool. Do you also have a pain with that? Is there a pain deep inside of not being accepted by the world for how great you are? Then let's change that. Let's get to mass adoption. So there is this chart that everyone knows. There is kind of the early adopters on the left side and then there's this gap that you need to bridge and then you can go to the mass market and it, in between it's kind of undefined. And uh, my claim is just that um, the crypto space hasn't managed to do this yet or has only managed to do that in very few like isolated areas. And the question is how can we bring you know, public private key cryptography to real people and replace this shared secret setup that we have on the internet nowadays with like centralized silos that keep a hash of your password. So, uh, Taylor, uh, I don't know, Mon Monahan is her name, I think, I gave a talk at the Ethereum Community Conference, uh, I think a month ago or something like that, uh, where she talked about fragmented user experience. And she just went through and she used a simple dApp and she wrote down every step that you need to take uh, to use the dApp if you're a new user. And she came out with impressive 45 steps that a new user needs to take uh, to go through everything. So it's not just, I don't know, like opening the website, but then it's, you know, going to an exchange, doing KYC AML, installing MetaMask, uh, until you're finally able to get a loan from Dharma or something like that. And obviously that is one of the reasons why things are not working or why there is no adoption. Um, I kind of think that um, this year we got three major things in place in the cryptocurrency space to go out and fish on the other side of this gap, on the other side of this chasm. And I think these are, first of all, seamless setups. So it is hard to make people install an app or download the plugin or anything like that. So that's out of question. Uh, it needs to be easier than that. Um, also, um, I don't know how it is in Croatia, but in, Euro in Germany, if you ask someone to think in dollars, they look at you very strange. And uh, I think it's similar in many other countries, so people can't make this mental conversion from one currency to another. And uh, scalability, so if anything that you do takes uh, more than three seconds, four seconds, you know, fish have a memory span of seven seconds, I think, then it's forgotten already. So it kind of needs to be snappy and easy to use. And um, there have been first applications this year where I think we've seen all these three things together. And um, how does a usual user journey kind of runs? Do you remember having your first uh, wallet? Does, who remembers his first wallet? Uh, almost. What, what kind of wallet was it? My Ethereum? Okay, not bad. Cool. So, uh, I think you also remember that uh, you tried a lot of applications and often it required you to set up a new wallet and then that new wallet was not so important so it got lost, right? And this is the experience that is not like an exception or like uh, something like that, but that's the default experience. So we have to deal with that. We have to kind of uh, accept that and go with it. So I think uh, when a user comes and uses an application, it should be like a temporary key, you know, something for throwaway. Don't deploy a contract for him just because he decided to land on your website. That's not going to be economical. Then um, 
they don't want to care about gas or anything like that. That comes at the very end of the user experience. They just get the token ideally, and then they do something with it. You, I'm sure you know the um, this ERC where um, um, where you can pay with tokens instead of with gas. That's kind of a step in the right direction. Universal login, I think it's called. And only after that, you when you recognize the value of crypto, when we've sold to them, when we have converted them to kind of be ins and not outs, then comes a permanent wallet, not before. Like you need to convince them before they start caring about it. And then maybe eventually they learn the concept of gas and they will keep Ether around and do KYC for you, but definitely not at the beginning. So my thesis of this talk is the following. Um, I think sidechains and child chains are the entities that will drive adoption on the first two steps of this letter. And then the mainnet, be it Ethereum or whatever you like, uh, will drive the adoption later when, when we've sold to the user. So think of child chains or side chains as kind of one component of your sales department to get to these users. So here, uh, just to kind of distinguish the concept of what is a child chain and what is a side chain, does anyone want to summarize it in one sentence? No, no hard opinions? Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, so uh, as an example for a side chain, I've chosen XDAI, which runs um, parallel, like, I don't know, it uses POA network technology. And what it is, um, it does about five second block times, and I think it's just a default Ethereum client. So you'll get your eight, uh, eight, eight or nine um, million gas out of a block. So you kind of know the capacity. And what it is on the mainnet is basically a multi-sig. So there's four companies of which three need to sign uh, to give you your money back, right? So. Um, it delivers scalability, so it has been used, for example, in Denver uh, for food purchases, the same stuff that we've been doing yesterday and today here. And um, they managed to sell, in three days, they managed to sell 4,400 uh, meals and I think cash in like $40,000. And um, even the vendors, which were not crypto people, said they really liked it because they didn't need to take off their food gloves, they could just keep preparing food, look at the tablet and see that things happened and they were super happy. Um, so the scalability was an element of that because when you went to pay you didn't stand there for like a minute waiting for your transaction to go through but after five seconds it was all complete. And uh, another example for a child chain is, uh, a pro is a product that comes from a project I'm working on, it's called the Leap Network. So we build a plasma chain this plasma chain has two to four second block times. And instead of being a multi-sig where you kind of deposit your funds in and then you get them on the side chain, there is a bridge contract. And the bridge contract works with the plasma exit game to secure your funds. You can kind of think of this like a state channel. You know, you put your money in and you use it like faster and cheaper. You use it in, uh, in apps or just for transfers. But at any point in time when you think, oh, I don't like this sidechain anymore, you can exit by just talking to the mainnet. You don't need to you know, push a transaction into the sidechain or something like that to be able to exit. So that, in that way, it's non-custodial, like a state channel. Um, and that is true for all Plasma dialects that there are and also uh, for, for state channel constructs. So what do we get with a child chain? With a child chain we get um, trust-free scalability, which means we have, this, we have the rules that are enforced by the mainnet smart contract, and you have the full power of the mainnet uh, proof of work that protects your money even while it is on the, on the child chain. So just wanna make this distinc distinction between a side chain and a child chain. It's very different because it has very different assumptions. Imagine you are um, a, uh, a decentralized exchange. Which of these uh, um, systems would you build on and why? Any, any volunteers? You're a decentralized exchange. What do you use, a side chain or a child chain? Why do you use a side chain? 
because of the world is sick. And how does that help you? So let's play through an example. Um, users have stakes, uh, like have deposits of about $1 million in your decentralized exchange on this uh, child chain. Um, there is four guys on the multi-sig which have a public identity. What do you think would it take to, you know, uh, bribe three of these four? I would, I would give one of the keys to some regulation institution. Yeah, you, you, you can't pick on this chain, but okay, yeah, just uh, uh, tell me anyway. So you would give one to a... To a regulation institution, I would give the other one to, I don't know, some IT company who is managing uh, stuff on building, building, the, building the exchange and to some, some other trusted institutions. And then if they're public, I don't think they are, there's any chance you can bribe them. Mm, okay, interesting. Good. Yeah, um, I I would build it on the other one, obviously, because I'm doing the talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. So I don't know the way that I think about like the bribing attacker model is just like, you know, to what extent is it secure? Like, let's say these guys are staked, right? So they put down $500,000, and in case they do a mistake, um, you get the funds. So in the moment that your decentralized exchange has deposits of more than $500,000, it's just rational and economical for everyone to do the bribe and you know split the rest. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you say you can take a public institution and put it in as a key bearer, uh, then, yeah, I don't know, I, somehow I don't trust that setup, but What's okay. What's the point? Yeah, but you can, you can also give one of the keys, let's say, to consensus, uh, to maker, to hold that key. Yeah, you I mean, trust them. sure, trust yeah, that, them. that's the thing, you have to trust them. Yeah, that's why I say the other one has trust-free scalability. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, so sometimes the tr trust is more, it, it's easier to trust sometimes. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I have this weird feeling. <laughs> but yeah, that's good. Cool. So um, I talked about the onboarding components, and here is kind of two things that I see emerged uh, this year or that I've used and I really like. That's the Dai stablecoin. Having a decentralized stablecoin is kind of important, and the vendors in Denver, for example, they didn't even like understand that there's a cryptocurrency underneath. What they could just do is there's a service where they could sell DAI and get it onto their bank account at the end of the event. So it was completely like digital integration. There was no agreement with uh, the conference as such. And then the burner wallet, was which was also used. So it works like this thing that you got at the registration. You scan a QR code, you get two things at once. You get a bit of funding and you get the the website or the app that runs the whole thing. And that has been done in, in Denver with about uh, 3,000 participants, I think, and yeah, not much money got lost. But here on the scalability side, I kind of wanted to point out that we have scalability, but we don't have trust-free scalability. And I kind of find it, uh, how do you say, like, I'm a little disappointed that if we go and we say like, oh, now we achieved kind of mass adoption because we used a multi-sig with three out of four and we call that a decentralized system, um, that is not good enough for me. And yeah, so that's why um, I want to tell you how we work on scalability and why we think it's important. So, but before that, I need to give you a short introduction to Plasma. Who knows Plasma already and can explain it? Four guys, five guys, okay. I'll try to keep it brief, and uh, if you have questions, then just shoot. So, we don't need that. Um, there is Alice and Bob. Yeah, some people have seen these slides so many times. There's Alice and Bob, and they want to send a million transactions to each other. If they give these transactions to the guy with the candle, which is the Ethereum mainnet validator, they pay thousands of dollars uh, for transaction fees. So they take the slightly less uh, serious looking guy, the plasma operator, and they give the transactions to him. And he hashes them all together and just puts the Merkle root 32 byte into the Ethereum mainnet. And this can be millions of transactions, literally, you always get 32 bytes as an accumulator, right? 
So actually what happens is he also puts a number on the Merkle root and he submits it into a specific contract which is called the plasma bridge or the plasma contract. And now we can do certain things with that. So the operator you would say like is just a single guy and we don't trust him so what if he just takes away my money, right? So let's assume the operator mines a double spend to kind of, you know, you, I don't know, he colludes with one of the users and then the user goes to a shop and pays something and pays something online with the same money at the same time. So if anyone sees this, they can kind of come along and they can call a challenge function on the Plasma contract with the two transactions and prove that this was invalid. And then how do you prove that the transaction is even included in the block? Wouldn't you, if the block is 10 megabytes, wouldn't you need to submit that to the Ethereum mainnet and pay a lot of gas again? Well, you don't need to because we have Merkle proofs. So if you want to uh, prove that transaction on the top left, you basically hash it and then you hash it together with its neighbor hash. And then you hash that again together with its neighbor hash until you arrive at the root. So logarithmic, uh, uh, not complexity, but uh, data, data requirements. So you see, you don't need to bring all the elements of the block. You only need to bring those which have letters inside. And the same is true for the other transaction. And then you just send this as a small compact package, doesn't cost you much, um, to the chain. And the Plasma contract parses your transaction and sees like, oh, they point to the same transaction. This is a double spend. And then the uh, you know, the block is reverted, the operator is slashed, and so on. So in this moment, the operator, because he is, uh, there is basically a light wallet client running on the mainnet, he is a restricted authority. He cannot just put any shit into the plasma chain. He has to follow exactly the structure, otherwise he gets slashed. Any questions about that? No? Cool. So, uh, oh, we... Yeah. When you say slash, does that mean something like uh, exit, uh, exit uh, mechanism? So in the default um, setup, there is first of all no stakes. So the only thing that gets basically done is the block is deleted. Oh, okay. And then if the u but if the users see that there is something funky on the chain, then they will most likely exit and go to another plasma okay. chain. Uh, but there is other designs where you can kind of take, it's just an architecture concept, this plasma thing, right? So you can combine it with, for example, proof of stake. And then you stake your validators and you have advantages of like censorship resistance and all this kind of stuff together with the plasma architecture. And um, what, what actually happens is um, when someone exits and at the same time they spend the money again on the sidechain, then you can bring that transaction as a proof and like challenge their exit so they can't get their money back. Who can bring it? Operate anyone. Anyone. anyone who sees the data on the plasma chain and the data on the mainnet. So uh, we launched this on mainnet, um, I think, beginning of February, so two months ago. Uh, the way we do this is um, we basically take uh, these blocks that happen every few seconds and we put them together in um, periods. 32 go into one period and then period is submitted as like a timestamp on Ethereum. So let me give you some numbers. Um, on the left side is what we can do, like 4,000 transactions per second um, uh, per block and then 1,400 per second. And this is what we actually achieved in our first month. Um, 0 0.5 transactions per block. Um, and about 0 0.008 transactions per second. I hope with this event it became a little better. I will give you some statistics afterwards. But if you want to make these statistics better, go out and spend some money on, on the drinks. That would be cool. Um, we did some load tests on our um, on our software and we actually found that if you load it with too much transactions then the throughput goes down so we are currently like working mostly on this like increasing the throughput and uh, yeah so submitting one of these periods the 32 blocks takes 82,000 gas and um, we had about a thousand uh, periods in February and we paid on average 5.3 gigawatt so to operate the whole chain and 
pay for all the transactions. Uh, we had a cost of $72 in February. And so if, if you want to give this a small comparison, on the mainnet now, at these prices, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bearish, I just did this a while ago. Um, you, you, you would pay 5.5 .5 cents for a simple transfer in Ethereum. On Plasma, in February, we've paid 1.3 cents. So see, we have like a four time improvement. But if we would actually like reach some of our, like a fraction of our theoretical capacity, we could do the same thing for 0 0.012. So lots of numbers, cool. But who cares about transfers? What the fuck? And then I think he throws like a glass, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we are working on uh, is actually we want to enable decentralized applications on layer two. Um, and that means not doing transfers, but actually being able to run smart contracts and stateful computing. And if you take a, an app or a dApp into layer two, it becomes a plasma app, and then we call it a plap. So, Please give some claps for the plaps. Yeah, I'm, I'm not done yet. <laughs> so how do these uh, smart contracts work on Plasma? They don't work the same way like on Ethereum because we can't exit state through the exit function. So what we have to do is we have to go to Bitcoin and kind of learn from the pay to script hash model. And the way they do computing on Bitcoin is you take some kind of code, you hash it together, you send money to that hash. And if someone brings a transaction where the script hashes to the hash and data that fulfills that transaction to true, that's a valid transaction and it's included and executed. The script is executed. And that's exactly how we run smart contracts on Plasma. So here is an example. It's written, it runs EVM bytecode, same as you know it. It's written, it can be written in Solidity. And here is a spending condition that just holds some money. And if the right guy sends a transaction, it releases the money. So same like a page of script hash on Bitcoin, but written in Solidity and running on this layer too. And um, this is stateless for, um, in this example, but we also have a model to, we also have a way to model state. So it's actually as powerful as the computing model on the mainnet, but you kind of slightly have to twist your brain uh, to get into it. So you would say like, if you do computation, how do you make sure that it's all like, you know, it's off-chain computation, how do you make sure that it actually works? Well, uh, what we've done is we've built an EVM inside of Solidity, and it can run any EVM bytecode, but it can only run one step because otherwise it exceeds the gas limit. It's simulating the EVM in the EVM. And the way we go about this is we have an interactive ch challenge response game between the challenger and the solver of a computation, if there is a dispute. And if you see, if you look at this as the execution steps of a program, each being the hash of all the state of the VM, so the memory and the stake and hash together, then they basically just start comparing. So they say, what is your state at the middle of the application, seven? And then they then see like, oh, it's the same, okay. They do this in a smart contract, they play a game in a smart contract. Then they check 10 and again, until they reach a point where they agree on one execution step, but they disagree on the next one. And what we just do at that point is we load our on-chain EVM and have it execute that one opcode to find out who's right or who's wrong. And that way we can kind of enforce all the computation that happens on the Plasma chain on the Ethereum mainnet, or at least it's a crypto economic game that makes sure that nothing invalid gets into the chain. Yeah, there is more spending conditions, uh, more UTXO models. But what I actually want to get to is uh, back to this uh, diagram. So um, we have the burner wallet to kind of drive mass adoption to make it easy. I know it's not perfect. I learned a lot of things from this event. Um, we have DAI and I hope there will be a Euro stable coin if anyone is interested in making one, a decentralized one. I'm with you, so please yeah. talk to me. And if you think about scalability, then please think about not only scalability, but trust-free scalability. And I know there's different opinions and some trust institutions, but if you think of trust-free, then I'm like, I want to play with you. Um, then I can talk a little bit about the community that is building this. So we are not a company. Uh, we are just a bunch of guys all over the place uh, on a, running a multi-sig 
and being funded by the Ethereum Foundation currently to build this. Plasma chain is like a global public utility, that's the purpose of, of our team. And yeah, if you wanna, um, if you wanna uh, join us in doing this, then you can earn some bounties and here's all the necessary contact information. <laughs>